What's going on, everybody? Welcome, welcome. We are live, and my name is Peter Martin, and I am so excited to announce and meet and get to listen to and get to speak with my very special guest this evening, none other than the very wonderful Mr. Fred Hirsch. How you doing, Fred? All right, Peter. Uh, yeah, we were talking earlier. I, you know, I, I had thought that we would have met somewhere backstage at some festival or another, but I don't actually think we have crossed, maybe. We haven't crossed. Um, I feel like I know you because uh, I, I, I know and love your music, and uh, I remember seeing your name uh, in the uh, New York Times, like playing at the Knickerbocker and like Bradley's, and then they used to have the jazz listings and stuff. And I was like, man, this, even before I heard you, you know, I was like 13, 14, and I wanted to come up to New York. And I was like, man, this guy's playing at all the places, jumping over trio, solo, and, and so, uh, and then when I heard you, your, you know, your, your name and then seeing you, it, it's just always been synonymous with just pure excellence and beauty at the piano. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm I'm very excited for tonight. I I'm sorry we're not meeting in person. We were just saying we're gonna meet in person. This is just the prelude to greater yeah. things to come. Yes, in, yes indeed. And uh, hi all uh, the uh, open studio folks out there. Uh, Peter's been doing an amazing job. I know so many people who get so much out of what you do, Peter, and uh, are really enjoying what open studio is offering. Oh, thanks so much, Fred. Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, we, I think we're all looking for the, these, these little silver linings and little bits of beauty and, and hope and optimism at this very strange <laughs> pandemic period. And, uh, you know, for me, I mean, this probably wouldn't be happening ha were we not both, uh, uh, you know, confined and sheltering in place and all that. So I'm, I'm eternally grateful already to, to have the opportunity to meet you in this way and to be able to converse musically and otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, uh, this should be fun. Yeah, absolutely. So welcome, everybody. Thank you guys for being here. I hope that your Wednesday uh, is, is going well and that you're safe. And, and as I always say, that you're with loved ones. And we're, we're going to do our part to keep us all spiritually connected as, as we're staying separate and staying safe. And um, I'd love for you to kind of kick things off if that works for you, Fred. We, uh, Fred and I just talked briefly we actually just met 20 minutes ago on our sound check and uh so i'm still a little nervous just from meeting him but i know once i, I hear his soothing sounds at the piano it's gonna it's gonna um, all start happening but we kind of talked about keeping this uh very open and, and actually we both brought the same idea uh and kind of spirit to this in terms of not really having a lot of uh plan in terms of what we're doing so what we're hoping as the as this next hour unfolds is just to kind of play whatever the moment um, needs and see w see where the next hour takes us. So I leave I leave us in the capable, the overly capable hands of Mr. Fred Hirsch to begin things. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm the uh, I'm the first batter here. Uh, uh, I think I'm going to start with a composition of Antonio, Car Antonio Carlos Jobim uh, that I've been playing f for eons. Um, I used to play it uh, with Stan Getz. That's where I learned it in the 80s. Um, and this is uh, Ogrange Amor. Thank you. 
Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. That's beautiful, Fred. Okay, now I can hear you. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Man. So I guess you all show me saw my shorts. Yeah, that's yeah, you know what? Like that's this is called a pandemic world. concert. We're like newscast. Well, here, look, I'll expose myself because I didn't think these were going to be seen, but these are my, right, yeah, you know, right. that's how we do it. Like that was that with her jeans and her trainers, you know? <laughs> that's right. So, um, yeah, I highly recommend uh, every your Joe Beam record from a few years back. Somebody made a note of that in the comments. It's just fantastic. I love the way. Um, and there's also an amazing video of you playing Joe Beam from uh, um, on another very very good Steinway at, at Jazz and Lincoln Center from a few years ago right, right, that, that right. people can check in on. So um, I'm actually, man, you got me feeling and thinking about Brazil and Joe Beam. And so uh, I think I'm going to play a little Joe Beam. We'll keep this Joe Beam party going just a little bit. Cool. Um, and that was A minor. So maybe I'll go, maybe I'll just lift it to a little A major and do some, some Triste. Beautiful. All right.
Yeah, all right. Nice, all those changes of keys, brave, brave person. Just saying you are uh, brave to change keys that much. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, and then I forgot, I was the, a couple of the times I was like, should I keep doing this? And then it, I'd already passed it, so I said, well, I'll try to catch it the next time. Right, right. <laughs> cool, yeah. That's, there's so much great crossover between uh, Brazilian music and jazz. Uh, you know, I just took a really great online Brazilian history course. It's just fascinating the way the music evolves mm. uh, there. It's an amazing culture. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I want to learn more, and I, I, uh, I love the, I love the, the contrapuntal stuff that you were doing, but just laying right in that groove. I mean, you never, you never left that groove, and oh, uh, and that's such a such a hallmark of. Uh, I mean, you know, in, in Brazil, you can go and hear uh, great musicians playing and just, I, I always call it like, it's almost like stuck in the groove. Like there's no, and you've got mm -hmm. that thing where it's like, there's no chance. You might miss a note, you might play something that you right. didn't intend, but that groove isn't going anywhere. And it's, it's such a, uh, an artistry you bring to that. It's wonderful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a diff just a different kind of swing. You know, once you get it, it's kind of like riding a bicycle. You know, you just don't lose it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love that approach. So one thing I wanted to ask you about before uh, we continue on, I'll just kind of try to pick your brain a little bit as we go. Sure. You're you're somebody that's uh, that's really known and heralded as a, a big influencer on this generation and the next generation and whatever generations we're in now of pianists. And uh, you know, uh, uh, Brad Meldow and Jason Moran are some of the the more well known. Um, disciples of yours, you know, in different ways, just stylistically and directly teaching and mentoring that you that that you've done. Um, and, and really all of us. I mean, everybody who's coming after you is 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 influenced by you. Uh, but Sullivan Fortner, who's a young pianist, and I mentioned his name right before we we started, we didn't even get a chance to finish the thing because I know he's always spoken very highly of you. And uh, I just wanted to throw a quick story out about him because I know you taught him later on and, and mentored and keeping in touch with him as I as I have. But I got a chance to sort of teach him. He came to a summer camp that I was involved in in New Orleans. He was like 13, maybe 14 years old. I think he was like eighth grade though, 13 maybe. And uh, it was like a jazz camp and he'd never heard jazz. I mean, he grew up in New Orleans so he'd heard it, but he hadn't uh, really, you know, but he could play a bunch of stuff. You know, he had great technique. He came up playing in the church so he could hear anything. Super nice kid. Um, and for some reason, I had the CD, uh, Herbie Hancock, Emperor and Isles. I happened to have that with me the first day. And I was like, have you ever heard of Herbie Hancock? And, uh, and he said, no. And so I laid the CD on him, which is kind of crazy. You've never played jazz, really. You know, you're going to a summer camp. And, and of course, he came back the next day and like had learned half of it somehow, just sort mm -hmm. of by ear and stuff. Yeah. But um, he's always been one of my favorite of, of the younger pianists. Well, he's not that young anymore, but I always remember, remember him at that age. But I was wondering if you could just, you know, if you had any recollections of when he first came to you and you've kind of seen him blossom from that later period on. Yeah. Um, uh, Jason Moran was teaching him uh, at the Manhattan School of Music. And it used to be when Jason was there, once a year he would bring his piano students down to my loft uh, downtown in Soho and... I would do a master class and all the kids would get up and play solo and I'd make comments and kind of like a you know normal master class but in my living room and uh, Sullivan was one of the people that got up to play and I remember he played I Fall in Love Too Easily which is a tune that a lot of young people play maybe not so well um, and uh, you know I was listening I, I, I thought wow this is really something and when Jason was getting ready to escort the students out into the hallway, I pulled them aside and I said, Jason, is this kid as good as I think he is? And Jason said, yes. You know, so it was clear that, that our perception, you know, not to pat ourselves on the back too much, was that this is the real, this kid is the real deal. And, and uh, I've been so fortunate to to, to meet and teach and mentor so many great young pianists and then become, you know, friends and colleagues as they segue into their professional life and we stay in touch and go to each other's gigs and, you know, it's, it's a very, there's a nice community of, of uh, fellow pianists uh, and even in this time of isolation, um, 
you know, doing some Zoom hangs with different piano players and just trying to keep in touch. But uh, you know, he's a uh, he's a uh, very special. He's a special one, and uh, he's uh, he's he's here for good. I think he's he's going to be a uh, uh, a big deal. Absolutely, I agree. I absolutely agree. <laughs> Cool. What you want to do next, Fred? Well, um, I guess in the early '90s, I made a solo album of the music of Johnny Mandel, who just passed away yesterday. And you know, uh, he was one of the great arranger, film composers. Also wrote tunes that are justifiably standards, the, sh the, stat the shadow of your smile. Mm. Uh, many others, and uh, there's one that I'd like to play now. This is from a very forgotten film that starred Julie Andrews called The Americanization of Emily. It's kind of a nothing film, but the theme song, Emily, has become a jazz standard, and um, I just felt like I'd like to play that and think about him. Hmm.
beautiful, Fred. Beautiful. Thank, thank you. That's uh, such a special song and a and, uh, big shout out. And uh, Johnny Mandel, you, uh, you really brought the, the vibe and everything. And we lost a master for sure. So you yeah. truly honored him with that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was. I got to meet him in the course of doing that project. He's a very, very lovely, unpretentious guy. Really, mm. just you know, really, really sweet, sweet person. You know, and uh, he had a great, great career. You know, on so many levels. Absolutely. Yeah, you did a little bit of uh, key changing in there as well yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why not? You know, got eighty-eight of them. Why not use a few more? Right. That's right. That's right. And during that, uh, I got two messages to pass along to you. Anat Cohen is watching, and she sends her greetings. Uh, and hey, uh, Anat. She's, uh, I believe she's still down in Brazil. Uh, she is, yeah. yeah. She's, in, she's in Rio. In Rio. Uh, and Romero Lubombo, he uh, oh. sent a text already. He's like, you guys sound incredible. I want to play with you guys now. Oh, uh, yeah. Wow, those are, those are two super special musicians right there. Absolutely. And... Um, and actually, yeah, somebody commented, they uh, compared you, uh, Fred, and I, I wouldn't have thought this, but I, I think the way they said it, Egg, Egg, uh, Egberto Gismonti, the great Brazilian pianist, that they were just comparing you with your uh, ability to just go between different styles, classical and jazz and pianistic things. And, and yeah. when I thought about it, I was like, that's, I think that's a great comparison. He is such a hero of mine. What a, mm. you know, crazy great guitar player, piano player, composer. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, I'm a I'm a I'm a huge fan, um, and uh, I've definitely swiped some things from him. Yeah, absolutely. Is it, uh, Laurel? Did he write Laurel? Or was that? Yeah, that's him. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you know, theft is how it all works anyway. That's right. That's right. We're just I, I like to call it just but just borrowing, passing along. You know. Right. <laughs> right. Recycling. Recycling is so popular now, so yeah. that's good. Yeah. Well, hearing you do that, Emily, it was it it made me think of. Um, Ellis Marsalis, who we lost uh, just a couple of mm. months ago, mm -hmm. and he loved to play that song, uh, and he did it in E flat, I think. And uh, between my memories of his version and hearing him do it at Snug Harbor and, and what you just did there, it, it's uh, it's really amazing. Um, so I was thinking about uh, maybe playing some Gershwin, and Beautiful. yeah, maybe a little bit of Embraceable You if that'll fit oh, into the vibe. Yeah, one of my favorites. All right.
Yeah, Peter. Yeah, great, great. One of, one of the great, great best standards. That's my favorite Gershwin song, that one. Oh, me too. See, there we go. Great minds think alike. We didn't set that one up. <laughs> no, no, you know, it's funny of like, if you look at the, like the five big guy American popular song composers, which in my mind are Berlin, Porter, Kern, Gershwin, and uh, Richard Rogers. Mm. Um, actually, I think Gershwin is my least favorite of the five of them mm. for some reason. There are only a couple of Gershwin tunes that I like to play, but there's so many more of Jerome Kern or um, Cole Porter or, uh, you know, I just, I don't know. I mean, they're they're great, but I just don't, I just don't feel quite the same about them, except that too, that for some reason that really gets me, that one. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I think there's, yeah, thinking about it, I, I love Gershwin's music, but a lot of it is not necessarily something that resonates for me in a jazz piano situation, mm. uh, as great as the music is. But yeah, this one for sure has got a lot of places it can go. Yeah. Yeah. So... Am I up here? You are up, yeah. And I was just going to ask you real quick because I want to sure. uh, just, I mean, we, we, we got time here. But yeah, I wanted, we got, I, nobody, I, there's so much else. It's Groundhog Day. Nobody's going anywhere. That's right. That's right. This is pandemic period, so we could take our time. But there's so much I want to ask you about. But, but one thing in particular is your longtime association uh, with the Village Vanguard. And um, uh, you've, uh, you know, performed in a number of different situations. And I believe we're, we're, we're the first pianist was the first pianist to ever play solo piano. Is that correct, at the Vanguard? That's, yeah, that's correct. And that's when Lorraine was alive, too. We, we have right. to note. That's what makes it especially amazing, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Legendary yeah. status. But, um, you know, yourself, along with, you know, several other amazing musicians going back, you know, the, the lineage of the club, you, you know, you, you have a very special connection there. And I know you're planning on doing some, some upcoming uh, kind of 
while sheltering in place situations there. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that can be talked about yet, but sure, I'd sure, love to absolutely. just kind of hear about, you know, your feelings for the room and, um, you know, why, why it, 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 it holds such a special place for us as, as musicians. Well, I mean, uh, it's been open for, since 1935, so that's 85 years, uh, virtually unchanged. Mm. Um, the acoustics are really special. It's very dry. It's a dry sound. Bone dry. I always say that. It's bone, bone dry. dry. Yes. But the beauty of it is I think it's the best place in the world in the club to play really quietly mm. because you can just play like the, br- the drummer can just go shh and you hear it all the way in the back of the club. It's just yeah. an acoustic miracle. And they had the good sense never to try to change it or improve it. They, you know, Max Gordon and then Lorraine and now Deborah Gordon have, they've, they know what it is and yes. they've just left it alone by some incredible miracle. Um, and of course, I'm honored that it's my home club. I, I actually get to play three full weeks a year. Um, so it's almost like this ongoing residency uh, where I can try different things over the course of the year, over the years. Yes. Uh, the first weekend of August, the Saturday and Sunday, the first and second of August, I'm going to do a live stream. Uh, they're doing live streaming now from the club, and the production quality is fantastic. They really did it right. Um, of course, no audience. Yeah. Uh, but it's very classy. Sounds great. And I'm going to be doing a, a trio with a different rhythm section than my longstanding trio with John Bear and Eric McPherson. I'm going to be playing with the great Drew Gress and mm. Jochen Rooker. We're going to do some trio. Nice. Um, and that'll be my first gig since I played at the Village Vanguard on the 16th of February. <laughs> wow. So it's like, that's a long time for jazz musicians between weeks. Uh, yes. So uh, uh, I'm looking forward to it, and people are supporting it, and and it's a way that the clubs can try to keep the doors open. Right. Uh, and musicians, you know, they're, we're not able to make what we would normally make because they're not selling drinks and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, it's something. Yeah. And um, I think this is just what's going to be going on for a while. And um, uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just thrilled. I just put out a duo record with Esperanza Spalding there. Yes. Um, that, that actually disappeared yesterday. It was only available for a month. But it was very exclusive. That's one of the most exclusive pandemic releases I've ever seen. You know, that was like. We raised over $22,000 for Jazz Foundation of America with that. Yeah. So. That bought a lot of groceries and trips to the doctor's appointments and, you know, much needed services for people in the jazz community. So, yeah, uh, eventually we're going to commercially release it, you know, when the coast is clear and, you know, all that. Well, I know it's going to be am- amazing. I'm looking forward to hearing it because uh, I know you have a uh, I mean, I love Esperanza and I know you're a big fan of hers and she of yeah. you. And uh, that's going to be amazing. And and. Big shout out to Jazz Foundation of America, an amazing organization, and, and thank you so much for doing that, Fred, in conjunction with them, because they are truly, um, you know, helping folks on the front line in the right way, you mm-hmm. know, um, and uh, they're they're the ones that are going to really help bridge the gap so that when the clubs can reopen, the musicians are not in some other field. Right. <laughs> you <Yeah>. know. <laughs> exactly. All right. So I'm up. Yeah. Um, I'd like to play this one and shout it out to a not Cohen down in in Brazil. Uh, this is a one of the older tunes in my book. Um, I think it's actually from the 20s. Um, and Anat and I have enjoyed playing it together uh, over the years. This is after you've gone.
I'm clapping one for Minnie. One for Minnie. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, that's such a uh, great tune. I remember Lewis hearing Lewis Armstrong do it, and it's kind of a you know New Orleans. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, it kind of stayed a regional standard there uh, among jazz musicians. That's like the only place I know that people really know it and play it. Yeah, I mean, I love some of those old, really, really old tunes, you know, pre, pre-1940s tunes. There's some really, really great ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny because I used to, when I was first really getting into jazz and listening to records and stuff, my, my father, who's a musician, he, uh, I, I kind of came to the realization, I was like, man, all these old tunes and records and solos, man, the stuff was so great in the 50s and the 40s and the 60s, you know, it was amazing, man. It was, there was like nothing bad. And my dad kind of looked at me and said, oh, there was. He's like, none of that stuff lasted, that's all. <laughs> right, right. No, there was, there was, you know, I mean, a lot of the great jazz artists, you know, that were under contract to the big labels, they had to kind of play or sing what the A&R people told them to play. And the, the mark of great artistry, uh, 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 Louis Armstrong or Rosemary Clooney or somebody like that as they could take some really kind of, you know, second rate kind of B flat tune, you know, not so great and make it, they could sell it, you know, they could make yeah. you, you know, they could, they could make it work. Uh, right. Um, yeah. I mean, they didn't have the choice that, that artists have now and certainly nobody was writing their own music then either, you know, Right, uh, right. It was uh, coming out of the built Brill building in the early days of rock and roll too. So. Yep. Um, absolutely. Yeah. So it's a different different world now. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was man. I loved your your just use of of your beautiful instrument there, the range of it uh, on that rendition. You know, going down to the <laughs> bass register, it sounds amazing. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's the way that you're playing it. You know, oh, it's thank uh, you very much. and and when you went down and were you know improvising with your right hand. And you shift it down into that tenor range. I love when you play down there. I think it's such a uh, underutilized uh, register for us as uh, as pianists, especially on a on, on a good instrument like that. So that was really special. And then, of course, the stuff up top was amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. So what you, what you got? Well, I'm thinking about you know the Emily really kind of has been on my mind, and since I mentioned Ellis Marsalis before, uh, you know he was kind of a uh, early mentor to me in my early New Orleans days. I mean, all of us that were young musicians down there, and it was such a special person and uh, amazing musician. Um, and so I'd like to play a composition of Ellis's. It's called Swinging at the Haven, and it's kind of a modern New Orleans anthem and standard played down there a lot. And Ellis actually owned a jazz club. He was one of those crazy jazz musicians that became a proprietor of a club for a short period of time, and it was called The, the, the Haven. So this is Swing End at the Haven. Cool.
Yeah, Peter. Not not the easiest tempo for solo piano, so bravo <laughs> for that. Yeah, thanks, thanks. What you know how it is too, sometimes when you, at, at least you move through some difficult areas quicker, the faster mm. you play. That's the one, the one, the one upside to it. <laughs> yes, less space between the notes. Yeah, as say. yeah. So, I, I mean, fr Fred, has this been a, um, how has this period been for you as, as a musician and more importantly, just as a person, this, this pause period? Like, how is it, uh, what's, what's your reflections on it so far? Well, I think once I, you know, living in lower Manhattan, um, you know, in the middle of March when everything stopped, I mean, there was a, a week or so of being just terrified, mm. um, uh, like most people, and shocked. Um, my partner Scott and I uh, have a second home here in, in the woods in Pennsylvania. Mm. And so uh, he was a little bit nervous at first about coming out here. And then once we got here, we realized, oh, we are so lucky to be here um like our biggest problem is keeping the squirrels and chipmunks off the bird feeder that's <laughs> like the first world problem out here mm -hmm. um and going to the supermarket is not scary and uh all that sort of stuff um i, I did daily broadcasts on facebook live just a, a tune of the day i called it yes. it was just sort of an offering and uh i just felt like well maybe that'll perk up somebody's day and uh, i did that uh, for a while. Now I do it occasionally. Um, I can't say that I've been super productive in terms of writing a lot of music. Um, I am going to, I'm going to record a solo album on this piano sometime this month, uh, which I'm tentatively calling songs from home because that's really what it is. Mm. And, um, so I've been, you know, playing the piano a bit more. I'm not a crazy practicer. I don't practice that much. Uh, but I've been you're going good to already. Well, you know, <laughs> you know I'm, I'm, I'm hitting it a little harder at the moment uh, <laughs> than, than I had been. Uh, but I'm really not putting a lot of pressure to accomplish that much. You know, if I have a nice day and read a good novel and take a walk or do some exercise or cook a nice dinner, you know, it's like just trying to be uh, uh, happy with more simple simple pleasures and and I'm sure once I feel that things are beginning to ramp up again and you know gigs are coming and this recording project I want to do is you know becoming more concrete I'm sure I'll get motivated but I, I tend to be more of a deadliney kind of guy mm -hmm. I need you know I need a tour I need a gig I need a record I need a something um, uh, I play a lot of Bach I've been mm. working on Bach um, uh, you know, digging out some old tunes that I haven't played in a long time, mm. thinking about what I want to record uh, this month. Yeah, I, you know, just uh, I'm so grateful. I mean, so many of my freelance friends, you know, are really struggling right now. Yeah. Uh, as month goes by without gigs, mo more months go by, and, and uh, the pandemic benefit money might end soon, and especially in two musician families where both of them, right. uh, you know, if, if one spouse doesn't have a job job, you know, with health insurance and all that stuff and a salary, you know, it's, it's just, you know, pe people are, you know, I, I have painter friends and dancer friends and actor friends and they're all kind of, you know, you know, as this goes on, you know, they've all said, well, we can be okay for a while, but, you know, right. a while could be a really long while. So uh, I'm certainly grateful and, uh, um, you know, uh, it's just hard to believe, you know, it's, we're, we're pushing four months of this um, and right. it's getting worse, unfortunately. So yeah. um, we just have to, you know, stay in touch with our friends and, try to play music and have yeah. a good day. And I think beyond that, it's just, you know, that's the best that I, I can think of to do right now. Absolutely. And I mean, uh, thanks for sharing your music, not only here, but at the live, at the Facebook lives, that was really an early inspiration to myself. And I know a lot of other pianists and just musicians, we were all talking about, man, have you seen Fred Hershey? He's doing a song a day. And everybody was like, how do we do that? We're trying to figure out what we're, 
what's what's going to happen tonight? You know, but I think right. that the, these little things that we're all our artists are trying to do is, um, you know, we we need the audience as much as the audience needs us. It, it's really the music. We all need that connection, that spiritual connection, mm -hmm. and we we can't be there together. So these are just little substitutes, but 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 hopefully they're they're reminders to everybody. Just like when you're at, when everybody sees you at the Vanguard, it's not going to be totally right because there's no audience there. But right. it's the Vanguard and it's Fred Hirsch on that Steinway with that crazy red, you know, um, uh, carpet. Yeah. Uh, uh, the curtain. The curtain. Yeah. yeah it's funny right. too when you mentioned earlier about how they they don't change anything. I've always felt the same way since the first time I played there. I, the genius of that place. Is they right. keep it, the, they got it right, and they keep it the same. Yeah. And yeah. I noticed even when they change like that curtain, they always get the same exact, exact curtain. Same with the carpet. Same <laughs> yeah. with the, the the green pool felt on the walls. Yeah. It's always they just replace it with the exact same thing. You yeah. Know, they're they're rightfully superstitious. And and I have and the to pianos, say, the pianos. I, you've been involved with some of the piano yeah, picking. Yeah, I, I picked you? the yeah I picked the pianos there. Yeah. Uh, which is a kind of a terrifying responsibility <laughs> for the community of pianists that plays it. But uh, yeah, I picked the piano there and at the jazz standard, I'm, I'm, I get that dubious responsibility, but. No, we are uh, so grateful for you taking all that pressure, but delivering for us. I mean, we all, I mean, I know whenever I'm talking to anyone, uh, you know, especially at the, you know, about the piano at the Vanguard, and like you say, it's so dry in there. You hear, there's nowhere to hide. There is nowhere right. to hide and everything can be heard, but you've, done a fantastic job with that. Oh, thank you. And look, we're lucky that we play the piano and you know, we can get some satisfaction by ourselves. I mean, if you're a sax player or a trombonist or a singer, you know, it's it's pretty tough out there right now or a drummer, you know, it's you know, it's we are lucky that we play a very an instrument that's satisfying on its own most of the time. That's right. That's right. Could you imagine if we were trading if we were two great trombone players playing right now, back and forth, man, it'd be, no. well, I mean, JJ, maybe JJ Johnson, <laughs> a few, but even so, you know, it's, right. that would be interesting. Well, what you uh, feeling, Fred? Well, I always close with a monk tune, so I think I'm not going to rock that boat. Okay. Uh, that, that's been my tradition for, I don't know, how many dozen years, 15 years. I always end a set with a monk tune, just feels like, a, you know, just have some fun and let it all fly yes um so i'm thinking tonight i'm going to play a monk tune with a kind of a dubious uh pedigree mm. uh, this is aaron l which is lenore spelled backwards and part of the tune we don't know exactly what was written by idris suleiman who is the co-credit who is co-credited on the publishing of the song uh, to me, he probably wrote the A section because the B, the, the, the bridge sounds much more monk-like. Yes. Um, but um, it is in the monk catalog and it's a, it's a super fun one. And so uh, I'll play that and then we'll come back and chit chat before we say goodbye. How about that? Sounds wonderful. Thanks, Brad. Okay, great. Thanks.
Thank you. Killer. Here. Man, I hadn't heard that tune in a while, and I I love that song. And I didn't know the backstory. I mean, well, I I knew that the the co-writing credits, but I think I think that you're right about the bridge versus the A section. Yeah, I mean. That's pure monk. Yeah, you know? exactly. You know, so yeah, it's, it's a fun. It's it's a happy one. It's a very happy one, and you know, I I love the sensibility you bring all the time when you play to play monk's music, and you you have such a, you know, tradition of of, of doing that, but you're a real master at it, and Thank you. you you bring uh, out the the stylistic uh, quirkiness, but the genius of the architecture of Monk's compositions with your style. And I love that because there's some other pianists, really good pianists, that whenever they go to play Monk, they either just totally, you know, just play it like it's any other music and don't really get into that wonderful Monk world of not just great composition, but great pianistic things and possibilities. They either do that or they just try to ape Monk's style and like running up and down whole tone scales and right. it, you know. If if you if you if you try to imitate monk you will lose you will you lose <laughs> it's not it's not a, it's not a a useful uh, pursuit you know yeah. it's like you know you, you know with with anything you have to get inside it and find your own way with it um, you know all of you out there who play you know like what we're doing here is theme and variations you know mm -hmm. and you got to know your theme you know if there are words know the words if, if there are chord changes, know the right chord changes. Mm. You know, uh, try to play it from the inside. It's not just like changes on an iPhone. That's not really where it is right now. You know, try to try to respect the the source material, and then you'll discover some really beautiful things. I think that's right. Because I mean, there's there's so much there if you if you if you give it that respect and just I liken it to and and the way that you play Monk's music. I, I liken it to l letting the, the tune come to you instead of chasing around after the song and trying to force right. it and everything. I mean, maybe with, right. you know, with, with weaker material, you got to do that. But when right. you've got this great architectural musical masterpiece, right. you know. Yeah, it's, they're all puzzles. You know, you just got to mm. salt, you know, just try to look at them that way. And some, some of them you just have to live with for a long time before you feel like you're ready to, to you know, to, to play them. So... Uh, yeah, it's it's always fascinating. I think, yeah, oh. very durable. Yeah, great stuff, man. Thanks, Fred, so much. And I just wanna I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. This means so much. I'm sorry we're not gonna get a chance to get to all the comments and stuff. Um, uh, but we see the love there. We really appreciate. Thank you guys for um, for your support and your donations. That's that's really touching. We appreciate that so much. Um, and I want to just give a, a quick shout out uh, to Pamela Driggs, who is Romero LeBumble's wife. It's her birthday today. And she's an amazing singer, but a really great friend. Oh, there we go. Happy birthday, Pamela. Happy birthday, Pamela. Yeah. Um, and she's, she's watching out there. And I also just wanted to give a big thank you to Brian Fielding, who's our mutual yeah. friend, uh, Fred and I, who actually, uh, this would not be happening if it weren't for him because he had the idea. And I remember when he first mentioned it to me, he's like, why don't you do, since you're doing some online solo playing, Fred's doing that as well. Why don't you do something? Else? I was like, Fred who? I just wanted to confirm who he was saying. I was <laughs> like, if it's just some random Fred, I don't know. Uh, he's like, Fred Hirsch. And I said, man, he's not gonna, he's not gonna do that. And, and Brian said, you know what, it's a pandemic. Folks are desperate out here, he might. And so he stayed on me and stayed on you about us uh, doing this and, and yeah. put it together. And I'm so yeah. so thankful for this, this time well, with you. I feel like I've gotten to know you a little bit and it's lovely hearing you. And uh, you know, just nice talking about stuff. That's know? right. Having a hang. Having a hang. It's great to have a new friend, and um, thanks for sharing your music. I hope we can do this again. And yeah. and um, everybody check out uh, Fred. The f that's the first weekend in August at the Village yeah. Vanguard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But don't come to the club because it's going to be no, locked. No, it's no. going to be you locked will not out. Get in. You will not get in. <laughs> but no, that's that, that's in. actually you know for for people that are and I know we got a bunch of folks from around the world uh, on the stream. I did see that. Um, you know, this is an opportunity if you haven't been to the Vanguard. Right. And, and I haven't seen any of the streams, but I'm so excited that they're doing the video and the audio. I knew they would because it's the Vanguard. Yeah, they, they, they did it absolutely right. You yeah. know, they they didn't cheap out. I mean, it really is very classy. 
That's great. So this will be an opportunity for you, um, you know, to really get to, to see that legendary place and to be able to hear, you know, truly uh, somebody who knows the room certainly better than any pianist that, that's alive right now. So that'll be wonderful. And um, yeah, uh, look out for Fred's forthcoming, well, he, all his great recordings, The Monk, The Joe Beam, uh, the stuff with Anat, The Esperanza Spalding when that comes out, the forthcoming solo piano, uh, his wonderful autobiography. He's a writer as well. We didn't. Even, you're going to have to come back and do this again <laughs> so we can talk about your book and, and all that okay. because that's a lot of exciting stuff there. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's Mr. Fred Hirsch. We thank you guys. Uh, remember, we're, we're staying apart, but we're staying spiritually connected through the music. Uh, love you guys, and have a great evening, everybody. Yeah, safe, safe, and thanks for tuning in. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>